We know not. Welcome, my friends. You're listening to the voice of the Eternal Gospel, a program brought to you by the Eternal Gospel Ministry. Founded in 1992 by Seventh day Adventist believers, this is a Christian program dedicated to bring you the prophetic fulfillment, warning, and revelations of the end times, and to promote the advancement of Christ in your life. Welcome back, my dear friends. This is Pastor Rafael Perez. I'm the host of the program, and I'm very happy to uh, have our uh, panel with us, uh, Brother Paul. I'm Paul Forrest. I'm a nurse by profession. I'm an elder at the Eternal Gospel Church, and I enjoy studying the Word and sharing it. Oh, God bless you, my brother Jose. My name is Jose Rivera with Patient Faith Ministry. I'm happy to be here, Pastor. It's always a privilege. My brother Patrick. Patrick Jones from Three Angels Publishing, and I'm glad to be here to finish up this story of the fiery furnace. Oh, my, my, you haven't forgot about that, huh? <laughs> okay, yes, uh, dear viewer, we were talking about this faithful uh, man that refused to violate or to enter into a false, into a false uh, uh, worship. But before we get into that, let's invite you to have a word of prayer, prayers with us. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to come to the home of so many good people that you have out there. Thank you for giving us this privilege and thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit to understand this prophecy that are about to take place on this earth. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 On previous program, we enter, we were doing a parallel uh, of what was taking place in Babylon uh, during the time of this Hebrew man. Uh, and this is found, this is story found in chapter 3 of the book of Daniel. And just, just, you know, a few seconds, what have we covered so far? Can you give us a few seconds? Well, yes. Um, Nebuchadnezzar, he created an all-gold image. It was 90 feet high. He called all of the men of rank in his uh, land or province and all the rulers and leaders, captains, and so on. And he made the mandate that they needed to come here to this gathering. And we kind of named it as somewhat ecumenical in a parallel. Right. But he made them come to worship this golden image that they might pay homage to Babylon. Everybody must come. That's right. Remember that. We read that chapter 3, verse 4. It was for the leaders and the people at large. There's a parallel um, in the enforcement of worship as seen uh, for these three Hebrew boys and our time. Mm -hmm. Even... Pope John Paul II mm -hmm. called for legislation mm -hmm. to support uh, Sunday sacredness. Mm. And in so doing, that places yourself and I in a very awkward position mm -hmm. because we cannot accept that. And mm -hmm. now, when there is law enforcing Sunday sacredness, we are right in a situation similar to these three Hebrew boys. That's right, that's right. And uh, I think we mentioned in a previous program how in Europe, especially, and our viewers can do a, you know, check in the internet, that they will see that throughout Europe, the movement of the so-called a day for the a family day, meaning a Sunday, the first day of the week, the uh, clergy and the Parliaments, European parliaments, are been going hand to hand for the past few years. So yes, that that is a parallel. But in future program, what we can do just bring to our viewers historical and ecclesiastical statements, even from bishops, from cardinals, even from popes, where they they say openly that Sunday is an image, is a mark on their authority. So we wouldn't get in, 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 into all that. Brother Patrick, you, you were going to say something in reference to that? Well, I, the thought that came to me is that um, the mar a mark of a false religion is the use of force. Right. And Christ's religion 
is voluntary and out of love from, from the inside. False religion using force to force people on the outside. So what you're saying is by a pope or by whoever implying that we must legislate into some type of religious belief because Sunday sacredness is not secular. It is a religious belief. And, and that I think even a child can understand that. But in previous program, we have been hearing that there will be this beast power in the end time, in the book of Revelation chapter 13. And I believe that many people might get confused what a beast is. I not, I not, I don't want at this program, you know, to describe or to tell what is the beast or who is the beast. No, that's not my intention. I believe that we should at this program at least read from the Bible what a beast represent. Okay. Can, can we go out in the book of Daniel? Yeah, I, I can give you a few verses, specifically in Daniel chapter 7, okay. verses 17 and okay. also verse 23. Okay, can you read it? Yes, if, if you were to read through this, you would see that Daniel had a vision and dream and he saw various beasts. Mm -hmm. And the way that you should study the Bible is that you compare Scripture with Scripture. Mm -hmm. And so by going through the Bible, looking at what the beast is, then you can see what the Bible is represented as. Notice verse 17 of Daniel 7. It says, These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. And fast forwarding to 23, says, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom. So a beast is represented as a king or a kingdom or a ruling power and so on. A, a, a power. That's right. right. Okay, so uh, leaving that clear, so... In the book of Revelation, chapter 13, what it is described over there, that there will be a power. And obviously that power is of religious nature too. Why, Brother Patrick? We can say it is of religious nature. Because it's calling men to worship. Okay, I mean... Again. And worship has something to do with one of the first four commandments in the Ten Commandments. Right. The fourth, first commandment, it is our obligation from us to our Creator. That's right. Is that true? That's right. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy mind, thy soul, and thy strength. And that should not be legislated. No. By any secular power. It, or should not be tried to impose by any church either. It, it cannot be. Love is always voluntary. Right. Uh, how can you force me to love someone? Right. It must come from within me. That's right. Okay. So going back again to our story of Daniel chapter 3, all right, since now, since Paul mentioned about this parallel, which was good, there is a parallel that is going to be taking place in this end time, and that's a, a fulfill what the Bible says that history repeats. That's right. We, we mentioned a couple of times already in this radio program. Now, the king was outraged when he saw these little people, three Hebrew people not getting together with the 99.9999%. Mm -hmm. He was outraged. Just three people. Just three people against a whole congregation. Empire. Yeah, yeah and let, let me just make mention of one thing. You know, Daniel... And the three Hebrew boys that you find as the main characters throughout the book of Daniel, specifically more Daniel, but these three Hebrew young men, they weren't the only three young men in all the kingdom. Uh -huh. But yet the Bible hones in onto their story and it shows that even though there are many that profess true Christianity, there's only a select few who are true to the core. And they're a good example for us today. Yes, yes. And then, uh, okay. So we got them already into the, this burning fire. Well, what happened? Did, did they die? Well, first, Nebuchadnezzar was so mad, he said, let's heat this up seven times hotter. Mm. Okay. And seven times. Seven times hotter. Perfect. The most... As hot as it could get. I okay. mean, you couldn't get it any hotter. Okay. And then he had his... His... Uh, Servants. Soldiers. Strongest, strongest men. The strongest soldiers in his army. They bound, him, bound them up. And he had them, he ordered those soldiers to throw them into the fire furnace. Now, those soldiers 
we're going to kill these guys. They should have disobeyed because they're violating the sixth commandment. Thou should not kill. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, but they went ahead and, obe and, and obeyed that order and threw them in, but they were slain. They were killed. They ended up yeah, being killed. What happened killed. to the three faithful few, uh, Hebrew? Well, the Bible says that not even their hair was, uh, the head was singed, their coats changed, or not even smell of fire was on them. Not only that, but who else was with that little minority in there, with those three? Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar himself saw that there was a form like unto the Son of God in there with them. He couldn't believe it. He said, didn't we throw three men in there? How come I see a fourth? And the fourth looks like the Son, the Son of, of God. God. So under, under whose side was God at that time, at that moment? The majority of the people or just on those three? It's always a small group. You, know, uh, you Matthew, got the point. When you, Matthew 7, it says that broad is the way that leads to destruction. But when it talks about the narrow way, it says few are the ones that find it. You got the point. I hope our viewers are following into this story. Because never... Ever in the history of God's people, truth as it is in Christ has been found in the majority. That's Never right. in, the, That's right. in the history. From Noah's time, my brother Paul, until today. I've been challenging this for years. Since God brought me out of the most popular church, attending a Roman Catholic seminary. I said it already. Okay, from a very popular seminary. God never, ever has been found in the majority of the people. Is that to imply that God has rejected the majority? Well, it's not that God rejected. It's the majority has not been paying attention to God's Amen. commandment. That's Amen. right. That's right. Okay. You see, and God here is on the side of truth. Just, just on he the sides pill. with truth. Okay, okay. So uh, the, the king himself was amazed to see what's happened. And then what happened after that? Because we, we, we need to finish this. Verse 25, yeah. Nebuchadnezzar comes near to the mouth of the burning, fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of who? The living most God, God. Most God. The Most High God. Come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth out of the midst of the fire. And Nebuchadnezzar was identifying them as servants of the Most High God. Who is that? That's the Father. That's right. That's right. And he had just seen the Son of God walking in the midst of the fire with them. Two distinct eternal beings Nebuchadnezzar sees at this time. And that's why Jesus, when he came during when his first advent, the Jewish leaders should have recognized him as that divine being that was with the three Hebrews. The Messiah. The, the Messiah. The Messiah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... And, 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 of course, we know the story. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar ended up praising God, the true God. Yeah, and, right. and we hope and pray that that might be the experience of many um, influential religious leaders on the same time. Absolutely. You know, everything that the devil tries to use, God can flip it around for better. Remember, yeah. the devil tried to drown all of the young men in the river during the days of Pharaoh and Moses. But God brought forth out of the river a deliverer. When Haman wanted to kill Mordecai, then he ended up being hanged by his own devices. You see, the same thing with the young men. They tried to destroy, or the strong men of, of uh, in this story here, Nebuchadnezzar, they tried to destroy the three Hebrew boys in the fire. They also got destroyed. And then after Nebuchadnezzar, see this miracle, he went on and established another decree. But we're going to get into that right after we be back in the short break. Paul and Jesus both predict that the church of God becomes a force against God. The radical faith that Jesus taught had become the official religion of the empire that murdered him. The speed with which the early church tobogganed into apostasy will take your breath away. Welcome 
welcome back. Okay, I have another little challenge for you to answer. How about if somebody might argue in our time? Well, but doesn't the Bible say that we must obey the authority? Remember, Nebuchadnezzar was the highest, the most influential man at that time. How can we answer that? Because the, the, the reason I'm bringing this, right after he saw that miracle, you know, that Jesus was there with this three Hebrew. Then he made another decree, which is found in verse 29. Maybe we should read it. Chapter 3, verse 29. Brother Jose. Therefore, it says, Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their house shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. So now he's making a decree. Humanly speaking, we would have think that that was a good decree. Uh, uh, um, yes, but the way, the way that the Lord is in his mercy and his love, he never forces anybody <laughs> even to make a civil or, for, or, or, or moral decision. You see, God just wants the loving obedience that springs forth from the heart. He doesn't force anyone to serve him. And if we understand that even though it seems to be a good decree that Nebuchadnezzar, he had no right to make this decree in the same degree as he had no right to make the first decree of worship in the earlier part of the chapter. So that means what we would call it today in our modern day society, government should not enforce no religion, should not be enforcing religious belief. Oh, Absolutely. not at all. Not Praise at God. All. I like that. Brother Patrick. The best thing a government can do is just provide religious freedom freedom to preach the truth and try to convince others in their minds by the weight of evidence. Or oh, freedom to preach even false religion. Well, that too, but... You, you, you know, yeah. I, I don't, you know, I, I believe that it's not a secret by, by now by our viewers to know that we are Seventh-day Adventist believers. That means that I believe on the biblical and the only day, seven-day Sabbath, which is God, God Sabbath. There's, there's shouldn't be no doubt by mm -hmm. now. But you know what? If there will be a law trying to enforce everybody or to me to keep the Saturday, God's holiday, uh, in, uh, 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 holy or, or resting, I would be the first one to oppose. That's right. It shouldn't be forced. It should also be, it be compelled. Even God's law that's eternal himself it's a law of love. Yes, right. he requires it, and we owe that to him, but it's still a law of love because he gives us the choice to decline it. If you Amen. Want to. Brother Patrick? I'd like to make a very important point here. Okay, go ahead. You always make a <laughs> no, very no, important no. point. <laughs> we know that by now. Did, did, Nebuchadnezzar, did Nebuchadnezzar have to make that decree? No. I don't think well, so. He was Why? the king. He... Well, let that, would, that decree was going to every nation, tongue, and people. Does that sound familiar? Yes. In the last days in Revelation, the first angel's message to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. But if he didn't write anything, would every nation, tongue, and people have gotten the same message? He could have worded it differently. He, he could, could have said, Now, O people of my realm, know ye that the God of Daniel, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is the true God. That's yes. a, a, and that should be enough. Yes. But Wor he, worship him. But what if that. he didn't write anything? What would have happened? Well, God would not have been glorified. Oh, he, he, oh but, hold it. No, he was already glorified. He had already glorified himself in the... Where, where do you see three men going into the midst of fire seven times out and not burning to right. ashes? So what would have happened? Well, the, well, the King, princes and governors and rulers would have gone back to their provinces and related this wonderful miracle exactly. which the God of Daniel did. Yes, they would have gone back. The whole world would have known. And this proves that, you know, a lot of times we'd say, how are we going to reach this gospel of the kingdom must be preached in what? All the, all, world. all the world, Matthew 24, 12. This 14, story shows... 14, yeah. This, That's fine. 
This story shows that three people did that job. Standing three people up for the did, they want to speak up. Three people standing up for the truth God used to get the gospel to all the world, whether, the, whether Nebuchadnezzar wrote about it or not. Okay, okay. Then, then, then can I go back to my original question in this segment that I just posed to you? Okay. And it's for you too, my brother Patrick, since you always bring good points. <laughs> uh, Praise the Lord. So, uh, Romans was not written. Uh, uh, chapter, you know, the book of Romans obviously came after the new, you know, during the, the New Testament era. But right there it says that we most, uh, we should obey our authority, talk about, you know, civil authority. Oh. How can we put together? Because the highest authority was the king at that time. And, and they refused. How can we, you know, if, if in the future, and we know, not, not if, we know it's going to happen because prophecy never fails. That's right. We know that this is going to be, that there'll be a place, a time, very close, very soon, where everybody's going to be forced Worship in a very wrong date of the week. Uh, the modern day Babylon is going to try to influence in everybody. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, let, let me answer. You know, yeah. I don't believe God in any way sanctions for his people or Christians to just be outright <coughs> disobedient to the laws of the land, to be menaces of society. No, we should follow the laws of the land so long as they do not go contrary to the laws of God. Our first obedience and obligation is to our Creator. This is the lesson that Christ taught when He says, Render unto the things to Caesar that belong to Him, and then render to God the things which belong to Him. Our first obligation is to be to the Lord. I mean, Acts chapter 5 and verse 29 says it clearly. You know what it says there? They were commanded of Jesus Christ, the, the, the great gospel commission to go and preach the truth to all the world. Christ being God gave them the mandate that you need to preach this to everyone. And then the Jewish leaders did not want them to preach. And then who now are they supposed to obey? The authorities of men or the authority of God? Verse 29 says, Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. Hmm. So every time when a civil government will try to make us to disobey God's law, a law of love, we should say, because we know that other, in other religion, uh, their belief is that you must kill, that you must, you know, again, enforce mm -hmm. uh, their belief. Obviously, Christ, the true Christian church, the true Christianity cannot believe that. Mm -mm. Because again, we must follow Jesus by love. Because we love him because what he did for us. That's right. Because we love our neighbors, our viewers. We bring this program to them. We're not trying to impose it. We don't have to call the governor or the, the, the legislators like Paul was mentioning at the beginning when there was a pope uh, not that long ago trying to uh, make... Uh, bring legislation to impose, you know, their religious belief. We don't have to do that. That's right. Because we, we the Christian, should be a group, a, a church, a group of people of peace and love. That's right. As God is. And and to be honest, is even even under, you could say the example of a corrupt government. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't say that uh, to call our own government corrupt as saying as a blunt thing, but I'm going to give you this example. Christ himself, where do you ever read in the New Testament or anywhere in the Bible that Christ made rants and raves against his own government during that time? Do you think the pagan Roman government was, was doing everything that they should have done morally and civilly and everything? No. Well, of course not. But he never raised his voice and was saying this and that and... But yet, at the same time, they were rebuked by the lifestyle and the teachings that he made because he was in accordance with the true government, Amen. the government of God. And, and he was interested to appoint his people to that kingdom. That's right. And the commandment demands that we have no other God before him. So if we adhere to some other authority uh, above God, 
then we take God from his authority and replace his authority with, with the, the, the secular um, uh, rulers. Right. God must occupy that supreme place as creator. Amen. Right, right. I, I, I want to go back to your parallel that you were mentioning at the beginning of the program because we're coming to the last couple of minutes on the program. Can we find in the Bible, my brother Patrick, a parallel? Are we going to find, can we read in the Bible, and especially in the book of Revelation, chapter 15, uh, a group of people that despite seeing the whole world following into a false religion, into a false teaching, they're going to be, the Bible described them as being faithful. Chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. Can you read it, please? And make a, make a little comments. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. My brother Paul, in Revelation 14, 12, I don't think it's a coincidence. Right after the Bible brings to us this great image that is going to be brought to everybody, to war, be worshipped at the same time, and the Word of God also bring to us a group of people that will stand up like those three Hebrews, saying, hey, wait a minute. Even though the whole world is going to be going, obeying a, a false worship, how the Bible describes that group of men, Brother Paul. If you would just permit me uh, a moment in verse 11, in verse 11 we see those who succumb to the worship of the beast, and in verse 12, here are the patients of the saints. Here are the saints. They keep the commandments of God and they have the faith of Jesus. Amen. So the, the, that's the condition that the, 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 few, the very few remnant are going to be found right in the midst of all this setting up the image, setting up, you know, the, the, this, this worldwide political uh, unity, false unity. We can see. You, you're going to say, I give you five, seven seconds. Very simple. God wants everyone on planet Earth to keep the Ten Commandments by faith in Jesus. Amen. Praise God. And my, my dear friends, yes, God wants all of us to be found keeping this commandment of God and having the faith of Jesus. God bless you all. Our Voice of the Eternal Gospel family thanks you for joining us. Generous contributors like you keep us broadcasting. Prayerfully consider supporting this ministry. Donations are tax deductible and can be sent to Voice of the Eternal Gospel, P.O. Box 15138, West Palm Beach, Florida, 33416. Our phone number is 1-866-7th-DAY-2. That's 1-866-784-3292. And our web address is voiceoftheeternalgospel.com.